How do you decide what to do? You ever face a situation where you found it difficult to perceive what the right thing to do was? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes it's easy. Telling the truth is the right thing to do. But how exactly you go about telling the truth is not as clear. <clears throat> how do you decide what the right thing to do is? How do you figure out what is actually good? Or what is going to be ultimately satisfying? You know, because sometimes you think you've figured out what the right thing to do is, so you follow that course, and then it turns out wrong. So how, how do you see ahead sufficiently to see what will be ultimately satisfying? Well, and sometimes the opposite is true, right? Sometimes you find yourself in some kind of difficult situation and you think the world is coming to an end and it turns out all for the best. I guess we should point out after saying that that God says it always will turn out all for the best. Sometimes that's hard to see. What's going to be actually good? What's going to be ultimately satisfying and What's going to be truly complete? How do you know when you're done with something? I've heard this about like painters. They're painting, and the hardest thing about painting a painting is knowing when to stop. I am a amateur hobby photographer, and I like to edit the photos. That's the thing about editing photos. How do you know when you're done? You know, I think I could tweak this. I end up with 20 layers of stuff on top of the photo tweaking this. And then you have this option in the software. You can turn this on and off so you can see the difference. Sometimes it's hard to see the difference. How do you know when you, it's complete, when something's done? Well, the Scripture says this, Therefore I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service or service of worship. <clears throat> Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, well-pleasing, and perfect what is actually good, what is ultimately satisfying, and what is truly complete. There was a title on that list, God's Will. Well, that just makes it easy then. All you need to do is know God's will, and then you'll know what is good and pleasing and perfect. What is ultimately, what is actually good, ultimately satisfying, and complete in every respect. Because God, when determining what God's will is, if that's a thing that, needs, that he needs to determine, but God, when determining what, he, what his will is, includes every last thing. When he sees 
what is the right thing for you to do in your very particular situation, he has not left out one single factor. In fact, he has always considered everything because he's omniscient. He always considers everything. And so what he would determine to be the right course of action for you is perfect, complete. Oh, and it's also ultimately satisfying, even if it requires some lack of satisfaction to get there. for uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego was to, that they would go into a fiery furnace. I'm quite confident that didn't seem like a really great idea. But they knew his will, which is certainly they would not worship any other god but him. And so they said it's better for us So they went in the furnace, and it was ultimately good. It was ultimately pleasing. The result of it was God protected them, and God gave his testimony of his absolute sovereignty over the king that required them to worship something other than God. Actually good, ultimately satisfying, truly complete God's will. Now, what this text tells us is that this capacity, it says you'll be able to test and approve. You'll be able to see and perceive, to discern in this world God's will, which is the actually good, ultimately satisfying, and truly complete course of action. You'll be able to see that. But developing that ability is what this text is about. And it's about developing that ability. And we're going to notice this more and more as we go through this over the course of the next few weeks. It's an ability to be developed. In fact, it's quite rare for God to just come along and announce to you his will about any particular decision you're facing. He doesn't normally do it that way. He can and has, but it's not the usual way because what he's more interested in is developing the vision in you, the wisdom in you to see it, to evaluate your situation from his perspective. Well, there are three factors in this text. The first one we've been talking about for a long time now, and that is true, true worship. That developing this ability begins, begins in trusting ourselves entirely to God in Christ and by the Spirit to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, our spiritual service of worship, true, true worship that says, I trust Him entirely to give myself to Him. A holy, living sacrifice is to trust Him entirely with myself. Well, I can see how that might lead to the understanding of his will, because what would be the point of you knowing his will if you don't trust him? He might tell you what to do, and you might decide whether you want to do it. But if you trust him entirely, then you (laughs) become trustable. Well, so that was the first thing, true, true worship. And this is really the primary way we reflect a real understanding of God's goodness. We might notice in this text that the 
basis upon which we offer this living sacrifice is the mercies of God. So we are not the first givers. In fact, we don't give anything that hasn't been given to us first because there isn't anything you have that wasn't given to you first. It, all your whole being is something He made. And so when you present yourself to God, you're presenting something to God that is already His. You're trusting, you're recognizing His creation, His redemption, His provision for you. You're recognizing that He has given all. He has given you His Son. And the Scripture says, if He gave you His Son, how will He not along with Him freely give us all things? So whatever you offer, you received. And this is the primary way we reflect our comprehension of God's goodness is to say, I trust Him. I trust Him. I belong to Him. And then we come to this. So, developing this ability to perceive what's actually good, what's ultimately satisfying, what's truly complete, to perceive God's will begins in trusting ourselves entirely to God in Christ and by His Spirit. And it involves actively rejecting the world's usual way of seeing things and doing things. And it is ultimately the result of a deep spiritual change of mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And today we're going to focus on that middle item. Do not be conformed to this world. To develop the perception of God's will, to really have a true vision of what's good and satisfying and complete, to really understand and see that involves actively rejecting the world's usual way of seeing things and doing things. And I would like to point out to you that that, well, it ain't easy. The world is tricky. So, let's look at this. Do not be conformed. Those four English words, do not be conformed, are all in one Greek word. I've, I've printed it in the bulletin there. I would try to say it, except that won't work out. So, you can just look at it there in the bulletin. <clears throat> I only printed it there because I wanted you to see the word in the middle of the word, the word schema. And uh, if you're an English speaker, you might recognize in the word schema, the word scheme. What is a scheme? Well, the word scheme gets used a lot of ways. One way it gets used is like evil plots. I develop a scheme. And usually when I develop a scheme, I, I don't have the benefit of others in mind. It also is used in, uh, in uh, developmental psychology, a schema is a structure of thinking. And we, as we grow up, we develop a schema, a sort of a worldview, a way, a, a model of the world around us that we use to think about stuff and process new information. It's a way of seeing the world. We might use the modern term worldview. And so when you confront some new information, you use what you already know and your structuring of what you already know to figure out the new thing. That's a schema. 
Oh, so that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about how when you confront a new situation in your life, how do you evaluate that situation so that you see what is good and acceptable and perfect? So, this is, uh, well, I'm sorry, but I have to give you some Greek grammar lesson now. This is a very interesting form of this word, which is a negative present passive imperative. Ah. The basic meaning of the word is to take the shape of something or the form of something like a mold, like if you have some Play-Doh, and you put it in one of those Play-Doh molds, and you press it in there, and then when it comes out, it's the shape of the mold. Conformed to that shape. Well, what is a negative present passive imperative? Well, first of all, it's an imperative, and that means it's a commandment. It's something you are told to do. Do not be conformed. So you're, you're commanded not to be conformed. That's what imperative means. The second thing is it's passive, which is very interesting. How can there be a passive commandment? Because what passive means is you are not the actor in the action of the verb in question. So if we say, for example, the ball was thrown that's a passive verb. The ball was thrown by Jimmy. Who's the actor in, that, in the action of that verb? Well, it's Jimmy. It's not the ball. The ball is the receiver of the action. The ball was thrown. And here it says it like this. Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. And this conforming action is not something you yourself are doing, but it's something that happens to you. You are the one conformed. You're the receiver of the action of this verb. But you are not the one doing the conforming. You don't press yourself into this mold. Well, that's really interesting because you're told not to do this, and yet it's not a thing you do. How does that make any sense? Well, it's kind of like this. You are called upon to actively resist this happening to you. Don't let this happen. That's the best way of looking at this. Don't allow yourself to be molded into the form of the world. Now, the last thing we noticed about this verb is it's in the present tense, which means it, we're looking at it like this instead of like this. If I said, uh, Johnny goes to the beach all the time, goes is in the present tense, and we're thinking, Johnny goes. He's in the act of go going is sort of this long thing. If I say Johnny went to the bench, that's a moment in time thing. This is the first kind, a present tense, an ongoing kind of thing. And what this tells us is this is a continuing problem. Do not be conformed. In other words, you don't just refuse to be conformed one day, and then you're not conformed. You go on refusing to be conformed. He's saying, make it a practice to refuse conformity to the world. Always refuse conformity to the world. Keep on refusing conformity to the world. The world is actively and continually pressing on you to conform. Always resist. 
And what is it conforming you to? Its own way of thinking, its own way of evaluating right and wrong, its own way of understanding the world around it and acting in that world. Don't fall for the schemes of the world. Consciously reject this scheme of things, this way of understanding, this way of living that is always pressing on you, like the force of gravity. You know, if you put a piece of Play-Doh on the mold and put enough weight on top of it, the force of gravity pushes it into the mold. It's all there. All, nobody has to actively. It just sort of sinks into it. And the world we live in has a force of gravity that seeks to conform us to its scheme. Now, what is this scheme? What is it we're not to be conformed to? Well, we've mentioned it several times, and that's the word in this text, world. But this is a really interesting word for world here. You know, the New Testament has two different words that we translate into the English language using the word world. We're going to look at another text a little later. Love not the world. That uses one of these words, the other one actually. <clears throat> that word used in that text is the word cosmos. It means the world system, the cosmos, the way things operate. This word is the word eon which you probably recognize because we have an English word, this exact same word, eon. We spell it a little differently. We don't use Greek letters. But it means the same thing. It means age. Age. In the New Testament, if you want to say forever, you say eons and eons. Or sometimes they just shorten it, eons. You will live forever. The way the New Testament writers write that is they say you will live eons and eons. That means forever. It's about the course of history. It's about the progress of time. So here, what we're called upon not to allow ourselves to be conformed to is this world, eons. It's talking about the times in which we live, the age in which we live, not the system, but the times, our time. You could say, don't be conformed to this age. I think that indicates something like this, the ways of human culture. It's like a worldview. It goes together with schema. The way things go, the way the world does, the age, this present age. Well, this was written ages ago. Are we still in the same age? Which age are we talking about? Which age is this age? Well, I think if we look at Ephesians chapter 1, we'll get a bit of a hint of this. What is this age that we're called upon to resist? I'm starting with verse 20. We're talking about the power of God, and it says in verse 20, the power that He worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we have a hint here that the age might be the age of the church. 
Well, he goes on, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I'm now in Ephesians chapter 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, <clears throat> among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying, about, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. <clears throat> but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. Now, you might have missed it, but <clears throat> in the middle of that was a, another reference to age. I noticed that this age at the beginning of the text and the coming ages at the end of the text, but here's where, and here's another place, you were dead in, the tra in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, age. That's the eon word right there. Following the course of this world. And what was the course of this world? Well, disobedience, living in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. By nature, children of wrath. By nature, children of wrath. That's the age, this age. This age is the one in which human beings are dead in trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, by nature children of wrath. Another place we could find the idea of the world, at least this age in which we live, is in 1 John chapter 2. Now here he uses the other word for world, but here I think what we get is something like, what is the nature of the pressure? How is the pressure applied that might conform us to this age? So I'm looking at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, do not love the world. Now that is the word cosmos, or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So here it's also connected to the will of God. This resistance to the world. So what are the things of the world? The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let me see if I can explain that a little bit. Sensuality the desires of the flesh, materialism, the desires of the eyes, and autonomy, the pride of life. The idea that I belong to me. The very thing, the very rebellion of Adam and Eve, we will be gods unto ourselves. The whole idea of individualistic autonomy or even in relation to others, what I need is 
something for me, admiration maybe. I am to be worshipped. I want to be famous. You know, I've noticed that dogs don't really care about fame. Human beings are very fame-oriented. I think that's because we're made to reflect the glorious nature of God, and in our fallen condition that has been distorted so that it serves self instead of God. So I've just come up with a bit of a list here of a comparison between the way the world scheme operates and the way the biblical framework is stated. So the world operates in a model of scientific naturalism. Now, the problem with this is not that it's scientific. There's nothing wrong with science. Science gets stuff figured out, and that is good. Science is a great method for thinking about how the world operates, the material world. But the problem with scientific naturalism is we've been s s focusing so carefully on figuring out how the material world operates and what its various cause and effect mechanisms are that we decided that that's all there is. The natural world is the entire world, and we have denied the existence of anything supernatural. Uh, the problem with scientific naturalism is not that it's scientific, but that it's naturalism, that it is the understanding of the world uh, in purely material terms, in purely material cause and effect terms. But the Bible says that the world is created by a person's by the triune God, who is a person who has eternal relationship and has created other persons that populate this world and other creatures that are living, and that this whole thing is His personal story. If you look at Hebrews chapter 1, it says that the Son of God carries, he's there, the creator, he's the one in which all things culminate, and he is the sustainer in that text. He carries everything from its beginning in him to its conclusion in him, and he, oh, by the way, also became a member of the story he's telling, a character in the story. He became one of us. And so, that man, Jesus, was there when the story began, and he, he's there. He's the one in which the whole story wraps up in him, and he's the one telling the story from the beginning to the end and writes himself into the story, becoming a man for our sake, to redeem us. This is not a purely material thing, which we can tell because we know we're not material things entirely. I have a material body, but I have an immaterial aspect. My mind, my thinking, my logical processes are not the same as my brain the organ in which these things transpire, the material thing. So we can tell just by looking at ourselves that this is not a purely material thing. It's a personal history of God and His creation. This is the nature of being. The second thing is <clears throat> the world sees our values as grounded in our personal autonomy and something we now call authenticity. This is what we're saying when we say, just be yourself. Or, more strongly, 
You must be true to yourself. Now, there's a certain sense in which that's just talking about a person's integrity, which is a good thing. But that's not how we always mean it. Whatever you imagine yourself to be is who you are, according to this line of thinking. And you are to be true to that. And we don't even start answering the question, how do you know what that is? Where's the grounding for that? But what the Scripture says is what, a, what we are and where our value comes from and where our moral values end up coming from, our value comes from this. We are created in the likeness to bear the image of God, the triune creator. That is where your human dignity arises from. You are an image-bearing family humanity, an image-bearing community humanity, made in the image and likeness of God to be conformed to the image of His Son. Oh, not yourself. To become the Christ you. Yes. And this doesn't erase you. Still you. But you conform to the image of Christ. That's not the, exactly the same as be true to yourself. The other thing we get to is some kind of moral relativism. Well, you can see why that would come up. If everyone's being true to himself, everyone is determining right and wrong for himself or herself. Or at least every culture or every society or every community is determining what is right and what is wrong for themselves by themselves, apart from God. Moral relativism. Where do we get our moral values? What is the grounding of our moral? Well, it's that very same thing. We're created in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, human beings as a creature are holy. So we have this expression that we sometimes use, the sanctity of human life. What makes it wrong for you to kill someone? That person is made in the image of God. Why is it wrong for you to deceive someone? Same reason. Why is it wrong for you to sleep with someone you're not married to? Same reason. Because God made us male and female marriage partners for life to bear His image. And he didn't say, there we have it, until he had a man and a woman and a marriage. And so, our value, our moral system is the natural derivative of that actual reality. It matters for that reason. And our disobedience to the law of God is destructive to our image bearing. The uh, world tells you to walk by sight. The Bible tells you to walk by faith, to trust in God and not your own understanding. The world operates in a sort of in a system of sort of something I call mutual self-indulgence. <laughs> you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And as long as the two of us agree about this back scratching, it's no problem. Or, on the other hand, we develop something called diligent law keeping religion. And our diligent law-keeping religion, which, by the way, a lot of us Christians lapse into a lot of the time, though we should know better, 
our diligent law-keeping religion is self-righteous. It is me meriting something from God or you or somebody, even my own head. It's me doing something that deserves reward. So that diligent law-keeping religion is part of the scheme of this world. Where the religion of the Christian faith is to trust ourselves to God in view of God's mercy. That's where we started. In view of God's mercy, present your body a living sacrifice. That's your religious act. Your religious act is to offer yourself to God entirely which is the only sensible thing you can do in the view of God's mercy. If you have any understanding of God's mercy, it only makes sense that you would trust yourself entirely to Him. There's no other sensible way you could act. It's your reasonable service of worship. It's also your spiritual service of worship. It is how you honor His mercy by trusting yourself to it. It is how you glorify Him by putting yourself in His care, acknowledging His fatherhood in your life. So that's the difference between the world and the Bible's approach, God's approach. Now here's our problem. The world does appeal to us. We are subject to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We're tricked by these things. These things can feel good and right even. Conforming feels good if you think about it. Conforming is comfortable. It's not conforming that hurts. It's when you don't go along with somebody's suggestion to shade the truth. Here's the thing. I want to just try to summarize what the world's up to here. The world is doing its best to operate apart from God. The world is doing its best to operate independently, apart from God, and to independently, independently prove our own independent value. To pretend self-sufficiency. It's the dumbest thing ever. I mean... Can you imagine self-sufficient? Are you a self-sufficient person? Well, you might think you make a good living and you t can take care of yourself. Uh, but you are not going to keep yourself from dying one day. You're not self-sufficient. But we pretend to be. What we're doing in this world is building the Tower of Babel. You remember the story of the Tower of Babel? You remember why they built it? They said it, to make a name for ourselves. So we'll be famous. It's a monument to the idol of self. <clears throat> it's just the way the world does. What are we called upon to do? Recognize and reject the scheme of this age. See it, reject it. Actively rejecting the world's usual way of seeing things. Now, here's the thing about that. The world's usual way of seeing things is also your usual way of seeing things. So you have to have some new conscience, consciousness. You have to have a different sort of mind to do this. You have to have a, first of all, you have to be a person 
determined to trust God with everything and all you are. And you're going to reject the way the world thinks and the way the world operates. Where will you get this sensitivity? Well, you won't succeed if you're not a true, true worshiper, if you're not, if you're not putting yourself before God, saying, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I look to you. I operate from you. I ask you what I'm supposed to be doing here. I ask you what you're doing here that I might get to participate in. I operate from the God reference in Christ and by the Spirit. Worship. Then I say no to the world's normal way, and I've given you some idea of what the world normally acts and does and thinks. But there's more. That's in the next sentence. Be transformed. Another passive command. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need a deep spiritual change of mind if you're going to see this change, this new capacity, this ability to see what is really good, what's ultimately satisfying, and what's truly complete to see God's will in your situation. That's what we're going to talk about next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the sacrifice of Christ, the mercy and grace that you have shown us in Christ. Thank you for uniting us to him in faith. Lord, we bring ourselves to you this morning and we present ourselves to you. We belong to you. We declare ourselves to be living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to you. We look to you to, to be our provider, to give us our, the wisdom that we need, to develop in us this new way, this new way of seeing things, of deciding things, of acting in the world, so that we become conformed to the image of your Son, to be real expressions of your nature, your love, your character, your grace to the people around us in this world so that they might see Christ, so that they might trust in you, so that they might be conformed to the image of your Son. Lord, we thank you that you are working all of these things in your people. We pray for the ministry of the Spirit to help us to submit to this process of renewing so that we are transformed. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.